Well, many of you will know, some of you won't because you're visiting, and that's wonderful. But uh, for about ten and a half years, I was a police officer in the Northern Territory. I did about seven years in Alice Springs, uh, where I went, met my wife Jess, and we had our, our family there, and then did another uh, for, further three and a half years on remote islands. So up in the Top End and the Tiwis for a couple of years and then on Grid Island. And uh, I loved it, it was a great job. But as part of the NT Police, we, we had a mission. We had a mission. Our mission was to serve and to protect by upholding the law. And I was proud to be part of that mission and eager to serve in that mission because it was a good mission. It was a good mission. But I, I found, though, that despite this good mission, it was sometimes difficult to carry out. Each day I would go out and engage people who were hostile towards the mission. They were hostile towards the law and even hostile towards me personally because of the uniform that I was wearing. And, and at times, to be honest, I got discouraged and I'd wonder, was I really making a difference? Was I really making a difference? Because I found myself dealing with the same problems over and over and over every day, even dealing with the same people over and and over every day. And I, I didn't see a lot of change in society, a lot of change in people as a result of the mission that I was a part of. The government had issued the law and we were upholding the law by keeping people accountable to it and sometimes even you know, bringing consequences for, for people's discretions against the law. But the reality was that the mission I was engaged in, which was in the name of the police force, had no power to transform lives or to change hearts. And so you shouldn't be surprised that yelling out to the bad guy running away, stop in the name of the police force. It doesn't work. The bad guy keeps running with his stolen goods and you have to chase. Jump fences, jump fences, run through bushes and all that sort of stuff. But, but as Christians, we have a mission. We have a mission. We're on a mission of Christ. His mission, and he's called us and sent us into the world to be a light, a light to the world, to proclaim his salvation, to make disciples in his name. And it's a good mission. But I wonder this morning, do you ever get discouraged on the mission of Christ? Do you sense the hostility of our culture on your mission? Do you sense it as you, as you feel the hatred that is levelled against the Christian voice by certain parts of society, as you witness rising perversity and wickedness in our culture, as you consider the hardness of hearts in your friends and family members towards God, as you struggle to present truth in an age of relativism, I wonder, do you ever question, can I make a difference? Well, in John 15, Jesus says, yes, you can. Yes, you can. Here in this passage, Jesus is preparing his disciples for a, for a mission of hope, even in the midst of hostility. They are together in the upper room. One of the 12 disciples, Judas, has already departed to betray Jesus. And only in a matter of hours would Jesus be crucified on the cross. And so right here in John 15, we are sandwiched between hope and hostility. But Jesus wants his disciples to know something powerful. That in my name you will succeed. You will succeed even in the face of hostility. And in this passage, Jesus uses the metaphor of the vine. And so we need to ask, who is who in the vine? And firstly, Jesus says, I am the vine. I am the true vine. Secondly, the Father. The Father is the vine dresser. And thirdly, the branches are the disciples, his followers. And we see the Father, he cares personally for the branches that are connected to the vine. Sometimes that involves pruning. Jesus, he's the source of life to the branches. And the disciples, they are the branches connected to the vine through whom he bears fruit. But how does Jesus say fruit is produced? Well, in, in these verses, in this passage that was just read out to us, two words are repeated over and over that you might have noticed. The first one is abide. And the second one is fruit, or the idea of bearing fruit. And so in this passage, Jesus is being really emphatic to emphasize it's a really intimate connection between abiding and bearing fruit. 
In fact, a bearing fruit, Jesus is saying, has everything to do with abiding and being connected to him. But you also should ask, what does the fruit look like? Well, in verse 8, read with me. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit and prove to be my disciples. Just like a flourishing garden in a, is a farmer's vine, and a vine dresser's glory and joy, this is the same purpose for the fruit in our lives, that it glorifies the Father, that the vine and the branches and its luscious fruit are the vine dresser's joy and joy. But, but this passage... While it is very much about uh, a spiritual growth, so much more than that. This passage is entirely missional. Jesus didn't want his disciples to stay in the upper room. He wanted them to, to leave it and to reach the world by abiding in him. And Jesus affirms this. Uh, it was always his intention in Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, where he says, In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that you may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven, so others may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is ever in heaven. So the whole point of the fruit is for God's glory and for God's joy and for people to come and to be connected to the true vine. And so in the context here, fruit means anything from our conversion to Christ or, or, or our becoming like him or the sharing of our faith with others. It all gives glory to God as his disciples. And it is engaged in his mission. Because wherever the sun is seen, the fruit of the harvest has ripened, and the Father is glorified. And so that's the theological explanation of, of the metaphor here. The vine dresser, the vine, the branches, and the uh, fruit and our abiding. And we know intellectually to be true, how weak do we sometimes feel? How powerless do we sometimes feel in, in the hostile culture that we live in? How do we make a difference? Well, the answer to first is to first to grasp and never to swerve from the truth in verse 5. If you look, look to verse 5, it says, For apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from me, you can do nothing. You see, the power for Jesus' mission is in our connectedness to him. He is the vine. He is our source of power. And in this verse, the Greek, the Greek word translated for able or can do is dunamine, also carries the, the idea of power. And so when it's combined with a negative, the literal translation might read, apart from me, you have no power. You have no power. And so Jesus is teaching that if you are not connected to him through, through, his, through the vine, through the Holy Spirit which indwells us, you don't have, actually have any power to do anything by yourself. You can't do anything to produce the fruit that brings glory to God. But if you are connected, you do. You do have the power. You have the very power of the life of Christ in you and flowing out of you. Lawrence of Arabia was a British author archaeologist and military officer who was famous for his liaison role in World War I uh, in the Middle East. And after the war, he took some of his uh, uh, Arab friends, some of his Arab associates, to Paris, a trip to Paris, have a look. And they, they were just fascinated by all the sights of Paris, which they have, had never seen before. They were amazed. But you know what impressed them most? Was the tap above the bath in their hotel rooms. And they would switch it on and off, on and off, just fascinated that they could just control this flow of water and have as much water they want whenever they turn this tap on. And so when it came time for them to leave, Lawrence came and found them in the hotel room with spanners trying to disconnect the taps. And they explained, we need these taps. If we have them, we'll have all the water that we want. You know, Jesus doesn't want us to make the same mistake of getting fixated with ourselves and our own strength of power to do his mission. Because unless we're connected to him, we don't have the power to bear the fruit that brings glory to God. The first, then this is our first reason for our confidence. The first reason for our confidence in his mission, that the power to be effective on his mission 
is our connectedness to him because he gives us the power to produce his fruit in our lives. And I want you to really take in what he's saying with me now as we read from verse 4. Take this into your heart. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. We don't have to bring the power to fruit bearing. Importantly, Jesus also makes the connection between his abiding in us and his word abiding in us. Have a look in verse 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. And so the power of Christ to produce fruit in our lives for his mission is not separated from his word. And the first display of Christ's power in our lives is, is, is our conversion when he leads us to respond in faith to his word. You know, and the fruit that Jesus is working to produce in our lives is in accordance with his word. It is his word that reveals to us who Jesus is and, and the mission and the life that he has called us to. So the more that we can take in his word, the more that we can expect the power of Christ to produce that fruit in our lives. You know, famous theologian, pastor and writer A.W. Tozer, he'd grasped this and he says this, the Holy Spirit always works from the inside out, never the reverse. As I allow the Word of God to soak deep into my heart, the Holy Spirit will begin working on my inner being, giving rise to ministry and witness that flows outward, affecting the world around me. You see, Tozer, he'd recognized that the power was inside to change him, but also that there was an important role that the Word of God plays in producing that fruit for Christ's mission. And so this is why he would challenge his congregation to get on your knees with an outspread Bible and linger in the presence of God. The power for our mission is in our connectedness with Jesus. The second reason to be confident that Jesus will make us effective in his mission is because of our connectedness to his love. The potency of our mission is his love. Look at verse 9. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Let that sink in for a moment. Jesus has loved us just as the Father had loved him and has loved him. And he showed us that love while we were undeserving sinners. He has loved us fully. He has held nothing back from us. He has given his life for us. Continuing on, Jesus then says, So abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. And so in these verses, what I want to show you is that Jesus is illustrating two missional aspects of the potency of his love, when, which are produced when we abide and first abide in his love. Joyful obedience and costly love. Firstly, joyful obedience and we see that Jesus, for Jesus, the source of his joy was, was to live obedient to the Father. It brings him great joy to do the Father's will. And he wants us to experience that same relationship. But it's a relationship that first begins by abiding in his love. A relationship that, that is, we are driven to obedience by his love, not driven to his love by our obedience. And so it's, it's this relationship that Jesus wants us to share that so we can experience his joy, the same joy that he has by doing the Father's uh, will. You know, and when we do this, 
as Christians, when we live obedient lives, joyful, obedient lives, according to the will of God, because we love Him, not because we have to obey Him, but because we want to, this is, this is really attractive to the world. Secondly, costly love. Abiding in Jesus' love also produces a missional love for people displayed in costly and sacrificial love. And this is a love that, that is difficult. It's a love that is costly. But when we first abide in the love of Christ who gave up his perfect and innocent life for us to pay the price of our judgment, our judgment dealt with for our sin, when we take that in and see what he's done for us, it moves us to show love, his love to others. And this produces fruit Fruit that moves hearts and transforms lives. And so here Jesus is calling us to love, to love up with joyful obedience and to, and to love out with costly love. He called us to a missional love. And when we abide in the love of Christ, it produces, it produces a missional lifestyle of love in our lives that, that is supremely attractive to a world that is lost to a world that is searching for purpose and meaning and hope for a, for a world that has been separated from the perfect love of God. The Christianity Today website published an article with the results of an extensive questionnaire, questionnaire designed to understand what attracts Muslims to follow Jesus. Between 1991 and 2007, 750 Muslims who had committed their lives to following Jesus completed the survey. And they were Muslims from 30 different countries, from, from 50 different ethnic groups, representing every major region of the Muslim world. And the results indicated that the influence that ranked the most important in their decision to follow Jesus Christ was the lifestyle of Christians. The lifestyle of Christians. A Muslim from North Africa said that, that there was no gap between the moral profession and the practice of Christians that he witnessed. An Egyptian Muslim contrasted the love of a Christian group at an American university with the unloving treatment of, a Muslim, of Muslim students and faculty that he encountered at a university in Medina. An Omani woman explained that Christians treat women as equals. Others noted loving Christian marriages. A Moroccan was even welcomed by his former Christian in-laws after he underwent a difficult divorce. And many Muslims who had fought, faced violence at the hands of other Muslims did not see this in the Christians they knew. This is the potency of Jesus' love. And we, and we are connected to it. It produces the fruit of joyful obedience and costly love in our relationship with him and our relationship with others. And it draws people to him. The potency for our mission is his love. The third reason we can be confident that Jesus will make us effective in his mission, his mission when we are connected to him is that the promise he has given us is fruit. He has promised to make us fruitful. The first indication of this promise actually occurs in verse 1 where Jesus says, I am the true vine. I am the true vine. And, but this statement leads us to question, well, if Jesus is the true vine, what is not the true vine? Well, the answer to that question is the true, the true vine that is not, sorry, the vine that is not true is the nation of Israel. And throughout the Old Testament, we see vine, image, uh, vine image, imagery used to represent Israel. But it's always used in a negative sense and, and with the uh, attachment of judgment because Israel as a vine only ever produced rotten, useless, uh, wild fruit that wasn't good for anything. Because the nation of Israel was a people called out by God to be his people, to be a light to the nations, to fulfill his missions, through whom he wanted to draw people to himself, to bless the nations through them. The mission of Israel as God's people was to connect people to God. But they failed over the long run because they were unfaithful and disobedient and they became corrupted by the false gods of the surrounding nations. And so then Jesus steps into the scene and says, I am the true vine. I am the true vine. I am the vine that will not fail. I will fulfill God's mission of connecting people to God. 
I will bring salvation and reconciliation. And we, as his disciples, we are the branches of his vine that he is going to continue his mission through. And in this passage, we also see the progression of language. You may have picked it up. It's an increasing one. It goes from fruit to more fruit to much fruit. And so it's Jesus' intention that we live lives that produce, produce an abundance of fruit, ever increasing. Now, this will not always be easy because it involves sometimes the Father pruning us to become even more fruitful. And this is, this is a whole other sermon, but, but I just want to say that, that God pruning us is also a demonstration of his love to make us more like, like Christ, to make us more fruitful. And it's a careful and a masterful pruning that he is in control of. But you know what? As, as the vine dresser, as the gardener, if he's also pruning, he will also provide shade and water and shelter when we need it because he cares for the branches. But Jesus, we're seeing here, is so desirous of bearing fruit which brings glory to God that he's also promised to, to give us whatever we ask for in his name, to give us whatever fruit that we ask for in his name. And we touched on this in verse 7 where Jesus says, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. And then in verse 16, down the bottom, You did not choose me, but I, I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, it may, he may give it to you. And so Jesus has chosen us he has appointed us and set us apart to do the task of bearing fruit that brings glory to God. Jesus is behind us all the way on this one, and he's even put his name on it. And so we are, as we live, ab abiding in him and abiding in his love and live and pray according to his mission, he will bless us with the fruit that will last, the fruit of his vine. So let us, let us ask God, let us, let us be a people, let us be a church that asks God for fruit. Ask God to give us fruit that, that, is, that he gives it to us in a way that demonstrates to, to the world around us that we are disciples of Jesus and in, in a way that brings glory to him because that is what's being promised right here. Friends, Jesus' mission is, is better than a good mission. It's a glorious mission. But this passage also reminds us of the necessity for it. We read in this passage that there, there, are, there are branches that are going to be burned. People, people that are facing, facing judgment because despite being around Jesus, they, they never chose to truly believe, to truly take him as their saviour. People, people like Judas, the disciple who betrayed him. And there are others who reject Jesus. And there are others who are waiting to hear about him. And, and, and in reality, it's a mission way too big for us, but not, not for Jesus. And he is our biggest source of confidence all because he is the true vine. He is the one fulfilling the mission. He will do it. His mission will not wither or fail. And it will produce an abundance of fruit. And as connected Christians to him, we can be confident that he will make us effective on his mission, even in a hostile culture, so that we should be proven to be his disciples to the glory of God. He will do it. Josh McDowell is a well-known author of, and Christian apologist and defender of the faith, and some of you may know him. But, but early in his life... He strongly resisted Christianity. In fact, in his university years, he set out to disprove that Jesus was real, to disprove Christianity. And he encountered the living Lord Jesus Christ and gave his life to him. His life was turned around. But, but growing up at home, life wasn't easy for Josh because his father was a town drunk. And going to school, his friends would tease him because they'd seen his father lying drunk and passed out in the gutter. And worse than that, he would come home and find that his mother had been beaten 
by his father. He would find her lying in the manure where his father had beaten her with a hose behind the barn. Josh, Josh had a hatred for his father that seethed. And he, he vowed that as, as he grew bigger and stronger that, that he would kill his father. And a time came when, when he came home from a date and he found his mother in her, in her bed crying. And he went into her room and she sat up and she said, Son, your father's broken my heart and I've lost the will to live. I only want to live as long to see you graduate from school and then I hope to die. As it turns out, a few weeks later, Josh did graduate from school. And the Friday following his graduation, his mother did die. And if it wasn't for Josh moving out of home to go to college after the funeral, he may well have carried out his threat to kill his father. But it was in those few years that followed that, that Josh encountered Jesus. And Jesus transformed his life. And Jesus took the, the hatred from him, gently took it from him and turned it upside down. And so that five months after his conversion, Josh found himself visiting his father and looking at him in the face and saying the words, I love you. Josh continued from that point to demonstrate the love of Christ to his father. And his father was so impacted by the change that he had seen Jesus make in his son's life that he said, I want that too. And so his father gave his life to Jesus. Praise the Lord. Fourteen months later, though, unfortunately, his father passed away with complications from his alcoholism. alcoholism. But you know what? In that 14 months that his life was given to Jesus before he passed away, over 100 people gave their lives to Jesus because of the difference they had seen him make in the town drunk. He had gone from the gutters into the church. This is the potency of Jesus' love. This is the power that is available to us in his name. We can't do it, but he can. Josh and his father were, were hostile towards God, but Jesus connected them to his vine. His power transformed their lives. Josh didn't have the power to get over his hatred for his father. When he said, I went to tell my father that he loved him, he didn't even really want to, but that was the love of Christ, um, putting that love into his heart for his father. That was the power of Jesus. It was the potency of Jesus' love that moved him to love with costly love. Because that was a cost for Josh to let go of his hatred, to let go of his bitterness of his mother's death. He paid that cost and received the promise of his fruit. And so did his father. You know, knowing the confidence that, is, that we have as Christians connected to Christ, that he will make us effective in his mission. Knowing that you are connected to his power and that you have the potency of his love and you have the promises of his fruit. I wonder, I wonder what will it take for you to, to increase your missional zeal by just one, one level? Whatever you might rank your missional zeal from between 1 to 10, what would it take for you just to, to increase it by, by one level this morning? Because we are his branches. We are on his mission. Now, I can appreciate that some, that some may be here this morning that just they don't actually feel much zeal for his mission at all. And maybe that actually not, you're not actually feeling very close to Christ at all, even though he is your saviour. And perhaps for you, it might just be as A.W. Toes encouraged his congregation to just come back to, to him and fall on your knees in his word and linger in his presence and allow his love to penetrate your heart once again because it will move you. It will move you to love him and it will move you to love the world and the people around us. Maybe, maybe there's some people in your life that, that, that God is calling you to love with costly love. And it's difficult. It is. Because it means giving up time or giving up money or, 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 or walking through life with a difficult person. 
but you have the potency of his love. And as you, again, abide in his love, that will empower you to love with his love. And, and maybe there's those people in your life, those unsaved friends or family that you've been praying for and, and just wondering, God, are you going to do anything? Are you going to do anything with this person? Are you going to save them? And that's hard. But I can I encourage you to, to trust in his promise and to trust, trust that, that he is sovereign and that what fruit he chooses to bear is up to him. But that if we are faithful and we come to him to prayer and ask for his fruit, that he will bless us with his fruit because we are connected to him. He will make a difference. He will do it. So be confident. Be confident that as a connected Christian, Jesus will make you effective in his mission. He will bring fruit to bear in your life because you are branches of his vine that will not fail. And he wants to bring fruit to bear in your life that proves, proves, not just to, 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 to God and to us, but to the world around us, that we are his disciples to the glory of God the Father.